right. So I had to take off the 50 pound cape I was wearing. So I look like I did a little bit of the wardrobe change, but um, I'm a big vulnerability person. There's no question that's off the table. All I ask is that you guys just state your name and basically we'll have a little bit of dialogue. I'd like to get to know you guys while I'm standing up here for 15, 20 minutes, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so like you said, um, my name is Marissa Ihus. I'm the regional manager for Florida. But I will say before I dive into this, uh, as you, you all are about to graduate, I think December, everybody's around November, December is the same November. time frame, right? Um, the number one thing that I look for in a company, and you guys all will assess this for yourself, is leadership. I've interviewed with a ton of companies. I've interviewed with a ton of different managers. And the reason why I am where I'm at is because of really good leadership. So. I've uh, got to take the opportunity to brag about you as well. I wouldn't have taken this job unless I was working for a great leader. So um, David is awesome. So when you guys are interviewing after November, December, whenever you graduate, also be interviewing the person that's sitting across from you because you're going to be working for them for maybe five, 10, 15 years, and they're going to have a very large hand in your development, right? So make sure that that is also an interview between both you and the person that you're sitting across from. So. Um, a little bit about me, this is my husband, this is my mom. Um, Boston has an award called Founders. So Founders is basically when you are the top rep for two years back to back, which is really hard to do. Because um, obviously your quote is the next year is predicated on your previous year. So if you're a top rep, you basically need a double in size. So when you win Founders, they actually fly your family out. And I'm gonna get emotional about this because they actually surprised me. Uh, they were not supposed to be on the stage, I think David, you were you were there for that too. Um, this was in Denver, Colorado. They flew. My mom is a single parent. Um, she's a waitress. She's been a waitress for 24 years. Um, didn't grow up with you know a ton of money. We're like lower middle class. So it's the first time she ever went out to Denver. She showed up in a shawl and a prom dress. She didn't know what to say. <laughs> she never been to a conference before. So long story short, that's my husband John, and that's my mom on the left. Um, and uh, you can't really tell, but my mascara is like halfway down my face. I was just crying the whole night. I literally got up to the stage and then they invited her on and they like surprised me. It was in front of our whole entire company. It's actually pretty cool. So we're talking about culture. That's something really cool that they did for me. Um, husband, husband, obviously we travel a lot. We don't have kids uh, yet, but um, this is our child that's Petey over there in the middle. Um, he is a Chawini. I don't know if you've ever seen <laughs> a Chihuahua Datsun, so it's basically a Chihuahua with like a wiener dog body. We didn't go in to get a Chihuahua, we went in to get a Rottweiler and came out with a Chihuahua. Um, and fun fact, we both went to ECU, my husband and I, um, East Carolina University in North Carolina, and we're pirates. So we were like, oh, we want to name our dog Petey before we went in. And then we loved him when we met him, and I was like, oh my God, John, Petey the Chihuahua. <laughs> we're getting the dog um, so a little bit about me obviously some travel photos on both ends and then this is actually a really cool photo this is um, he was talking about me being an FSA when I came into Boston Scientific we were part of a pilot program so urology pelvic health had never had FSAs before or junior reps as they call them and uh, we were a pilot program of 2016 and this is um, back in 2019 I think when this photo was taken and everybody in this photo at this point had been promoted to managers, territory managers, trainers, um, and obviously the pilot program did really well because now we have FSAs in every single franchise within urology public health. So um, a little bit about me, a little snippet. All right, so um, not to brag, but I, my hope in this whole entire conversation, and obviously I wanna keep this as fluid as possible, but my hope in this entire conversation is that once you strip our titles away from us and the big Boston scientific corporate company, corporate lip service, you guys realize that we have a lot more in common than you think, right? So in this slide, um, this pretty much is just my awards, rookie of the year, uh, president's club, business part of the year, uh, founders. I mean, there's, there's a ton of awards and incentives that you can win in Boston scientific. Um, it's amazing company culture, uh, as he was discussing earlier. Um, my passions, um, I'm big on influencing people. That's what drives me. I absolutely love, I think I get that from my mom. She's been a waitress for 24 years and I just saw her engage with a ton of people growing up. Um, collaborating, culture shifter, uh, anything that I can put my name on where it's going to light a fire under somebody, I'm gonna do it. Um, and then current right now, I manage a team of 10 for Florida. As we were mentioning earlier for the employee resource group, uh, ERGs, I am uh, part of the Young Professionals Network. I'm the co-lead. I actually created the uh, chapter for the United States for urology, pelvic health. Uh, and then I am also a part of 
something called Rise, which is really cool. It's any new talent that we have that comes into Boston Scientific. Uh, we can link up with uh, and basically be a mentor to any uh, incoming talent coming into the organization. So, I mean, pretty much this should just tell you that there's a ton of things that you can get involved in with a company like Boston Scientific, Striker, Arthrax. You just kind of have to um, be resourceful and networked, and you can be a part of any of these organizations if it's something that you're passionate about. Good question. Yeah. Uh, I'm Justin, by the way. Yeah, nice to meet you. Um, so I was wondering, what made you want to switch from the sales side to like the leadership role? Because, yeah. I mean, it seems like you're doing also very well on the sales side as well. Yeah. So I guess why would why did you make that change? Or yeah, that's a good question. So I'll show you on the next slide too. Um, the company before. So when I went to college, I went to college for communications. Communications. You can do anything in it, right? I wasn't like, oh, I want to do medical device. I just knew that I wanted to, I actually thought I was going to, I wanted to be in journalism or PR. Um, and then I realized I didn't have a passion for it. And then I went into sales actually right after college for a company called Insight Global. I don't know if anybody's heard of them. They are a headhunting recruiting company. Started out as um, a recruiter then went into an account manager, and then went into national accounts. And then I had a friend that actually worked in pharmaceutical sales and another friend that worked in medical device. So I left, um, long story short, I left Insight Global as a national account manager where I was leading 14 people. So I knew I already had a passion for building teams. I knew I already had passion for um, basically just like recruiting new talent, building people up. Uh, so when I came to Boston Scientific and there was an opportunity for the FSA role at the time, I didn't have medical device experience, right? And that's big for big corporations normally. So I decided to take a couple steps back and pay um, and just generally like what I was doing in my career to get a step in the door with Boston Scientific and then um, just kind of climb my way up, right? Like FSA, TM, business partner, and then I made my intentions known in the beginning. I wanted to lead people. I made it very clear in my very first interview with my man my previous manager at the time, Dan Specklin, who uh, David knows very well and who's been with Boston for about 14 years, um, that I wanted to be in leadership. And I was like, I'll do whatever it takes, right? Like put me in the right room, put me with the right resources. Uh, I've led teams before, I know I wanna get back there, right? And I've learned, I've been with Boston six years and I will say coming in, knowing what I knew then, and knowing what I knew now, I was not ready in 2016 to lead a team of 10 for a medical device company. Now I'm ready. Um, also, there comes the humility and the part that he was talking about before being humble. I wasn't ready in 2016. I needed to get my bearings underneath me. I needed to basically learn all the skill sets I needed to to be a, basically a good leader within the organization. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Yes. Um, hi, my name is Jesse. Nice to meet you. Um, and um, being a RISE mentor, do you find a common denominator among like the challenge for your talent? I know you guys diversify in culture and everything, but is there something or some things you can point out that are yeah. just challenging? That's a good question. Um, I think it depends on who's hiring, right, and where you're hiring. Um, I will say this, and also the level you're bringing them in at. So, you know, obviously we have FSAs, we have trainers, TMs. Uh, depending on the type of skill set they have and who you're bringing in. I don't want to say it's difficult. I will say this, depending on what that hiring manager is looking for and then who's applying, I think if we go in with a checkbox, right, we're never going to hire the right people. And there's a lot of people that do that, right? They're like, oh, like you guys, you obviously came to the sales college to check a box so that when you go into an interview, you can say, I went to medical sales college, right? I have X, Y, Z skills. Um, but there's some people that come out of the military that don't have that. And like he was saying before, that have tangible skill sets that transfer into some of these jobs, right? So I really think it depends on the person that's hiring and how open-minded they are to who's sitting across from them. I don't think it's really that hard to find talent. I think you really just have to be open-minded to who's applying for the job. Would you add anything? I, w I would add that everything that you say is right. This also helps. Yeah, right? absolutely. It helps you a lot. It's not the same trying to teach someone to work on a sterile field on the OR or how to sell to a doctor or how to sell clinically. All of those things that you're learning here, oh my God, that is going to make so much easier our life. Right? It's more almost like plug and play. Learn our products now and go sell them. Uh, but to her point about it's not that there's not the talent to find out there. We also need the talent that is going to be patient. 
Mm -hmm. There's a lot of anxiety in the world right now. People join organizations with one year of experience and they want to be director of sales. And it, that's the reality. You, you have people joining in, hey, uh, I'm an FSA, how can I become an RM? I don't even know your name. Right? Let's be patient, let's, let's work hard, let's, let's get those. And that is a challenge right now. And that goes to the adaptability. How do we adapt? How do we? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hi, I'm Andrea. Um, what are your check boxes when you are doing the interview process and what makes it in the same Yeah, that's a good question. And, and to piggyback off of what you were saying, um, I look for, so as my team, I have one of the larger teams in the United States. Um, honestly, I'm, interview I'm in interviewing the individual. I mean, to be quite frank, like, are you trustworthy? Are you passionate about what we're doing here? Um, do you have all of the tangible skill sets? Yes, that's required for the job. Obviously, there's a job requirement, right? And you have to meet 100% of what, what that is. But a lot of stuff, like skills we can teach. Like, obviously, you guys are coming out of this program, and you knew more than I did going into Boston Scientific. I didn't know how to set up sterile field, honestly. I, I was like, uh for like two months, you know, that's all they did was just pump re training resources into us. Do not touch us. the blue, do not touch the blue. Uh, honestly, they were like, you know, I was like standing in the back like, oh my God, there's a patient on the table right now. Um, but also I saw like the patient wake up and I saw what our products did for them, right? And then I was like, oh my God, I'm, in, I'm exactly where I need to be, right? So I'll say this, I think I'm interviewing the person, I'm making sure obviously you have the, what's on the job description, but more than anything, are you a good fit for my team? Are you a good fit for our culture? Are you a good fit for my team's culture? And are you gonna represent the brand, like Boston Scientific, because the brand is our people. So you're not only just talking to physicians, you're talking to directors, you're talking to C-suite, you're talking to nurses, right? So basically, how are you gonna represent yourself and how are you gonna represent Boston Scientific? That's a big part of what I look for, because I can teach skills. That leads to my question. Um, what, what do you, what's the, What's the skill that you need to have in order to communicate the clinical better? With, I'm sorry, say that last clinical. part. Clinical. Uh, what, what skill do you, how do you communicate with clinical? Clinical? Yeah. What are, what are skills that you need and, and, and just, you know, ways of communication? From a clinical standpoint. From a clinical standpoint. You'll, honestly, you'll learn that as you go. Um, playing the new card, like money, right? Like anybody that's on my team that's new, like FSM, like go in and say you're new and you're learning and you want to learn from them. Physicians love to teach, period, right? Like go in, be humble, they'll teach you. I will say like all the, all everything you guys are doing here, fantastic, right? Uh, but once you leave here, there's still a learning curve, right? So um, absorb everything, be a sponge, absorb everything they're teaching you in training. Uh, latch on to mentors, especially from like a clinical standpoint. If there's somebody that's, I have like nine in Boston Scientific and I call them for different reasons. And I have like mentors outside of Boston Scientific that I call on. So latch yourself onto people that will help elevate you. And then I'll just say like, learn, like there's like no dumb questions. Honestly, if you're being humble and from a clinical standpoint, if you don't know something, you're never gonna know it unless you ask. Like ask all the, I say the dumb stuff, ask all that in the beginning when you come onto a company. We have stuff like IST. Um, we have significant training in Boston Scientific. I can't speak to other companies, but uh, for the first three months, that's all you're doing. Like I have three new employees right now on my team. Uh, IST is actually, I'm flying out Sunday. I don't have to fly out, but I am gonna fly out up to Marlboro for the first half of their clinical session just because I wanna IST, be in the- sorry, IST is initial sales training. Yeah, and most companies have that when you come on board so that it helps with the clinical aspect. Um, but also, you know, latch yourself onto people that are mentors, trainers within the company. And then like for myself, um, I, I came from Stone. So I came into, pro you'll see this in a second. I came from Prostate, went into Stone, came back to prostate and the franchise has changed a lot since I left and there's a lot I don't know and I tell my team that so I'm also going to IST to learn the oncology side of Spacer which is a product that we sell so I'm actually going to IST with three of my team members in the same class like this and I'm sitting next to them because I need to be just as well versed as they are in the in the subject matter right so that that comes with humility like I'm not going to beat my chest and say hey I'm your RM now I don't need to know about this go sell it you know so just latch yourself on to really good people within the organization via sponge and mentorship, I think is huge. I wanna add there, like to your question, mm -hmm. people are not born clinical. No. Like you are gonna learn that. In Every you're day. Gonna, everyone here is gonna be more clinical than anyone else I'm gonna interview also here. Mm -hmm. There's the skills that she mentioned, 
and there's well, the wheel. Well, it's not. It's the not wheel just, is the most important part. Yes, yeah, it's, it's not just clinical, like uh, like terms and stuff. Because I do get that you know uh, mm -hmm. doing the work is going to teach clinical terms, but more so communicating with people, yeah. people skills wise. What what have you guys learned? Yeah, um, listening. Yeah, it's an art, right? Um, I'm still working on it. Uh, I have to like stop. I get like passionate when I talk to people, and I have to like stop myself sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, listening is an art, right? So I think, um, and who are you talking to, right? Because all my directors, and I'll just put myself in my previous role, right? Because my role is a little bit different now. But no matter what director or what C-suite I was sitting across from, at the end of the day, you're a rep, and they know that, right? So how are you going to relate to them and Obviously, we have an agenda, but at some point you have to have a relationship with these people, right? So how are you going to find common ground with these people, develop a relationship, and earn the right to ask for the business eventually? Because if you go in there and you're just like, hey, where's my, where's my PO, Sarah? She's going to, like, you're just never going to develop that relationship. Or if every time you're going in there, you're hounding them about a product, that's how they're going to see you, right? So I think the first thing for me was going in and building a relationship and then earning the right to ask for the business, and disarming them so that when I would like knock on their door and be like, hey, how are you today? Someone just got a promotion. Oh my God, that's awesome. Uh, and then eventually they bring it up to you sometimes, right? So I think it's just, it's, it's the art of listening and disarming somebody, if that makes sense. Hello, Marissa, my name is Gio. Um, you kind of just mentioned something that I've been observing about you and you said it yourself, you're very passionate. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as to where that passion is coming from and the why as to what got you into medical devices. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I am ridiculously and unapologetically passionate about just people in general, like family, friends, people, like I just, uh, energy, like I absorb it. Uh, I could honestly probably be in any industry. I just love medical device. I love patient care. I love seeing the impact that we make. Um, I'm very passionate about Boston Scientific, right? Um, I'm not just saying that because you have my boss in the room, right? <laughs> I love my job. Um, <laughs> but no, I really do. I, I love what we do. I really mm -hmm. do. And I love the people that work here. Mm -hmm. So like before when I was talking about leadership, like who you work for is important, but also who works for you is important. Like I absolutely would run through walls for anybody on my team. Like that is important. So kind of to answer your question a little bit before, like I would do anything. And honestly, they would do anything for other team members on my team. That's what I want. Like we had somebody out for a family emergency, Andres Apollo, our business partner, hopped on a plane that same day, canceled one of his, well, he didn't cancel the case, but he did help lightning uh, on a video, hopped on a plane, flew to Orlando for a case, hopped back on a plane and flew back because we needed somebody in the room for that case. That, those are the people I want on my team. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's how I, honestly, that's what wakes me up in the morning. Like that, like seeing that is just, that's what gives me fuel, right? Mm -hmm. um, Cause at the end of the day, we're just people leading people, right? Like there's, <laughs> I'm not special just because I have a title, but like they spent eight or nine hours of their day reporting to me and working for this company. I want to make it the most enjoyable experience as possible, mm -hmm. right? So, Thank you. Yeah. I think you had one too. There's one in the yeah. back. You. So, um, like, obviously, we're all looking at positions right now. Yeah. And, we're, and we're literally scrolling through and seeing, obviously, LinkedIn has everything and anything under the sun. So, would you say to apply for something that you feel like you're, um, you meet the requirements? Like, me personally, like, I don't have a bachelor's degree, but I have 15 years of military experience. There you go. So, there's a whole lot of skills there that aren't necessarily transferable. But to bring that up in an interview, would you say to do that? I think you just answered your own question advocate for yourself, right? Um, they don't know what they don't know. So you can't go in expecting, I think some managers that you can't, you can't stop it, right? Some, some managers that will interview you will have that objection, but know how to fight for yourself and advocate for yourself. Uh, I wouldn't have got where I got without it. And I'll actually do the next slide so you guys can see that. But absolutely, like he was saying before with the previous candidate, you literally were in the military for how long? 15 years. Okay. I mean, this conversation's done. <laughs> you know, I would much rather have that conversation about what you did and how maybe I can transfer those skills in this job uh, versus somebody who has a bachelor's degree who just isn't motivated to be there, right? They're just trying to resume climb. I want you, I don't want that. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Hi, Marissa, Hi. Molly. Um, I guess I don't have a specific question, but I'm appreciative of your ability to 
present sort of as a as a vulnerability and an, an openness to people while still uh, being a successful female leader. Mm -hmm. Is that something you could maybe speak to? Yeah, um, it hasn't been easy. I'll say that I'm 32 years old. I'm young. I know when I walk in the room, I know when I walked in this room, you know, it's I'm a 32 year old female and I have regional manager under my name, right? It wasn't easy getting here. I had to claw, sc scrap and fight every way that I possibly can, but I have grit and I have determination. I know what I want. So advocating for yourself. I know I wanted to be a leader. I've led people before and I knew I was going to get back to it one way or the other. And I was willing to learn to get there and take a lot of feedback, like he was mentioning it before. Um, humbling myself, taking a lot of feedback as a female, how I could basically be coachable to get some of these roles and earn, basically garner and earn some of that respect and um, shut down some of the biases, if that makes sense, right? Like unconscious bias, we all have it in some sort of way or foundation, right? So um, I think you have to address where you think you're falling short. And then I think there's also a sliver of imposter syndrome, right? Um, just because you're a female doesn't mean that you're not worthy of being a regional manager, director, or VP. Our two highest leaders in our organization are women. I remember the first time I saw them on stage, I was like, oh, I was like, this is home, you know? But Megan Scanlon and Chris LaRock are amazing leaders, and there are two, you know, there are two highest uh, professionals in our organization. So to kind of answer your question, I think imposter syndrome for women or a black male or an Asian or whatever you are, I think you kind of have to take out your self doubt and look at where your gap in your actual like resume is and take yourself out of it and just kind of address that with wherever that gap is in your resume, with your quality of you know your life or wherever you need to basically uh, improve on to get to the next step in your career, if that makes sense. I also, I also think that your work, like Marisa's work, spoke for herself, but also after that, is how do you empower others, mm. other leaders? How do you talk to them about adapting to a situation? For example, if she has a good leader, and that leader, by mistake, does what it calls a man's plan, she has these trends and the abilities of, hey, come on, let me, let me show you this. Mm -hmm. Because maybe that person didn't do it, or, it, it was a mistake, it was an error. Now, if it continues, then, okay, you have a problem, right? And it's the same, right? how, do, how do we help others and our leaders and educate? Like, listen, many things have changed in the last 10, 15 years. We cannot expect everyone to know everything about culture, diversity, mm -hmm. equity, inclusion. It's on us also to lead and to teach and to educate other people. Yeah. So her work, like I told you, spoke for herself, but also as a leader, she's been able to educate us and other leaders say, listen, dad, you have to be careful. Don't, dad, don't say that I get in front of others because it might resonate wrongly. And that's how we have yeah. created this culture that we have right now. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you an example. I got an email um, that had all males on it, and I'm the only one. They said, fellas. They addressed it with fellas, and they wanted feedback. Mock's not a dude, um, but, you know, I could have got upset about that. Like, it's just little things, right? But, like, it's not worth my time. It's not worth my time to be honest. I'm, I'm leading a team of 10, that's worth my time. I'm diverting my attention to that. You're gonna, like, what, no matter if you're a female or if you're not a female, you're gonna face some of that, right? Like that, that's adversity. Uh, but what's worth your time and what's not worth your time? I think you just kind of have to navigate that too, right? Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm Andre. Um, thank you for coming. Yeah. Um, speaking to you having like, spending your time on your team of 10 and helping them out, what's some things that you like from your team of 10 that helped you out? Yeah, all of them are different. Okay. Every single one of them. I mean, honestly, if I could have them up here and align, like <laughs> you would be like, all of them are different, but all of them are amazing individuals, amazing humans. Um, Scott Phillips uh, is a very tenured rep, 47 year old man who is a lone wolf and just wants to work hard for his family and he wants to go home at the end of the day. He doesn't need the rah rah, he doesn't need the calls, right? So it's basically matching my coaching style to his development style. Uh, and then I have Andres Apollo, who he spoke to before, who is my business partner. Absolutely love that man. The most, you think we're passionate? He's, he would run 52 circles around here and have like basically everybody standing up and doing exercises. Like he's got all the energy in the world, loves Boston Scientific, loves the brand, wants to be a leader one day and has different needs. Um, Scott and Andres are very different. 
and how I interact with both of them and how I develop them is very different. But at the end of the day, Scott was the one that was out earlier that I was referring to where Andres jumped on a plane to help him out. So culture, right? Um, and a roundabout way of answering your question, it's everybody's different, everybody has different needs, it's really meeting them where they're at. If that makes sense. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right, so this will kind of answer, well, oh, <laughs> there we go. Hang on. All right. Oh, wait, oh there we go. All right, there we are. Okay, so this kind of answers what I was talking about before. Um, went to East Carolina University as a comm major. So you guys are far ahead of me in your skill set right now. Um, and then went into um, velocity management, which I got from Boston Scientific uh, for leadership training. It's actually a really cool leadership program that Boston Scientific does. If you're, if you call it a hypo, if you're a high potential within Boston Scientific, uh, basically you get nominated by, who sits on that board? It's like pretty much all of our VPs, presidents, leadership. pretty much all the upper executive leadership that nominates you to be a part of the velocity program. So that's if you're a high potential and if you want to be a leader. <laughs> Uh, and then obviously you'll see over here, I was kind of talking about this before, I thought I wanted to be a radio journalism. Uh, I realized that was never gonna get me out of North Carolina and I was probably gonna make $25,000 a year, which probably not gonna work out for me. Um, and then I did uh, public relations for Mellow Mushroom, which was actually a pretty cool job, but once again, just wasn't passionate about what I was doing. Um, then I went into Insight Global and started out as a recruiter, account executive, that's where I cut my teeth in sales. Uh, then went into national contracts, which is actually pretty cool because when I came into medical device, I was running our entertainment arm for contracts. And so all the contracts that we did with hospitals kind of just clicked for me and the tiers and why we did pricing and structures the way that we did. Uh, and I was able to speak to that in my, my interviews when I went into Boston. Um, and then Boston Scientific, um, you'll kind of see 2016 to 2022 is obviously the impact here. I, I came on as a field sales associate. Um, some companies call them ASRs. Um, you'll hear ASR, FSAs, um, associate territory managers. Um, so started out as an FSA, was in that job for almost a year, then went into, uh, that was actually in prostate health, and then went into t uh, territory manager role where I was managing Orlando uh, for Stone. At the time, it was a $4.6 million uh, book of business. Uh, got promoted to business partner where I was the team lead for the state. Andres Apollo was the guy I was referring to before. He's my business partner. Um, basically, you're secondary to the, the regional manager. You have a little bit more responsibility. It's almost like a, a RM in training, if you will. Uh, and then I became a national trainer for the United States. So basically training all the new talent that was coming in. They would come to Orlando and basically I'd have them for a week and I would train them. Bring them into hospitals for their first, second, third week on the job. Um, started an ERG, um, sales advisory board lead, new product LME lead, I mean pretty much anything I could lash my name onto. And then um, eventually my territory grew to about 10 million and um, I promoted my FSA and then I most recently as of April 1st got promoted into the regional manager position for Prostate Health. So I actually made my way back to Prostate Health um, as of most recently. So. We kind of talked to this already, but does anybody have any questions about like evolution or positions and companies? Yep. Do you feel like it kind of like rolled quickly, like the FSA into territory manager? Cause you said it only took about a year, but I, and I know like yeah. we've, we've kind of heard different stories from different reps. Like, yeah. does it roll really quick? It depends. It depends on the company. It depends on the product. It depends on your leadership. I will say this. I think the best advice I could give you guys is make your intentions known when you come in, but be practical about it. Like he was saying, you can't come in and be like, hey, I want to be the RM next year, right? Like there's levels to this stuff and you have to put in the work to be qualified for that. But I will say for me, because it was a pilot program, I knew they were assessing what we were doing. And I knew that revenue was important. I knew that we had to grow these territories in order to basically justify me getting a TM role, which we all did. And actually Prostate Health wasn't even a division yet. It just, we had just purchased Greenlight, the Greenlight Laser, which was a AMS company. Um, we all ended up moving and growing and getting promoted outside of the, that FSA role. Um, but to look back on it now in 2022, it's an entire franchise. It's three products, three very different products. Um, and it honestly all started with that pilot program, which is kind of weird. But um, 
it did happen fast. I mean, I was there for a year and I think that was a good enough time. I learned a lot. I'm glad I was there for a year, to be honest. I wouldn't have wanted it any shorter and I wouldn't have wanted it any longer. It was a year for me to kind of get my feet underneath me, watch all my TMs, what I liked that they were doing, what I didn't like, and then I moved on to uh, the TM. I'm gonna interrupt you for a second here. All of this is super important, super. Mm -hmm. But it all started by doing this job yeah. well. If you go in trying to do what's next, mm -hmm. you need to execute at that level. You need to show that you can plan a territory, that you can yeah. hit, hit your quota, that you can hit your number, that you can educate physicians, patients, yeah. and that you're ready, right? Sometimes if there's not a territory need, can take longer, but it's not on you. You've been doing everything you can. Mm -hmm. That's where we look for other options. Okay, let's put you as a national trainer mm -hmm. so you can get more revenue, other compensation. But the most important thing, when you all go and join that first company after you finish medical sales college, crush that job, mm -hmm. okay? And it starts with the training. Yeah, yeah. Um, I took, I mean, this is in the spirit of vulnerability. Does anybody know who Brene Brown is? Mm -hmm. Okay. She's amazing. She's a really good like life coach. Her books are incredible. She talks about how to just like empower yourself, basically. Um, I'm just saying that because this next slide kind of taps on it a little bit. But I made the jump from national contracts manager to FSA. That was a hundred thousand dollar pay cut that I took to basically work for Boston Scientific to get my training wheels on, as I like to call them. And to answer your question directly, yeah, I was in that role for a year. And yeah, the pay decrease sucked, but look at where I'm at six years later. So. Mm -hmm. uh, good question. Um, maybe not for me, uh, just maybe more about for me than other people, but how'd you find out about like specifically urology? Because like yeah. here in this course, like I feel like you just kind of get down the track of like ortho mm -hmm. or trauma or like in spine. So like, like how'd you get involved in like the other subsectors? Because like, did you play that good neurology or did you try oh. to go to like ortho first? But then yeah, that's a good question. I actually interviewed for an ortho job with Stryker at the same time I interviewed for Boston. And I actually got both my job offers in the same day. Like I was sneaking out into a conference room back to back because I got offers on the same day from both. Um, I found out about it from, do you guys know medreps.com? Mm -hmm. Medreps is incredible. Uh, I would say latch yourself onto like a couple of really good recruiters uh, Elkie O'Brien was one of mine, and I know she's super highly networked within not even just like Boston Scientific, but like all the big companies. Um, she's E L K E O'Brien, if you want to look her up on LinkedIn. Um, great, great. She's amazing. Uh, she actually talked me into taking this job because I couldn't get out of my own head. I was like, it's a $100,000 pay cut, Elkie. I'm not going to go do that. I can go to Stryker and no, it's not a W 2, it's commission, but I can make money as a territory manager. She actually. Hired, she's hired like what? How many out of people out of urology, public health, Elkie? A lot, like probably 50%. She doesn't even, she's not even a recruiter for Boston Scientific. Um, she talked me into this job because she had perspective. And she told me about the culture. She told me about urology, public health, how it was growing. Um, she asked me to meet the, the manager and Vance Backlund's amazing, um, my old manager, so. If we can hold the questions for a few more minutes we to finish out. the slides, because we are gonna have are we running 15 out? minutes, yeah. and then we're gonna. So med reps, I think is really good, and then attach yourself on a couple of really good recruiters, because they'll give you perspective too. And then, I mean, this is just, we're big on quotes, I guess, but, and everybody knows who Oprah is, but um, you know, your real job in life is to figure out as soon as possible who you were meant to be and begin to honor your calling in the best way possible. I'll just say this, do whatever lights your soul on fire, right? It's a total waste of time. We are not on this earth for a very long time. So yes, the money is great. Yes, the products are great, but also like who you work for is extremely important and the company you work for is extremely important. So make sure when you guys are um, meeting these individuals that you're also interviewing them. Um, and I think that's probably the best advice I can give you guys. So.